Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Holmes. Uh, I'm a uh, developer on the PowerShell team since the beginning, author of the PowerShell cookbook. Uh, and we're going to have a really interesting session today. Now, if anyone plans to learn anything about PowerShell, there's the door. You can walk out right now. Um, if anybody wants to see PowerShell used in a computing context, there's the door. Uh, this may be the most practical session that you get out of the conference. Um, and if I have my way, all of you will retire one or two years earlier. So let's see how that goes. Uh, adulting. I, I realize this isn't a uh, necessarily a common phrase. So adulting is when people are like, I'm an adult now. I'm doing some real adulting. So that's what, what this is all about. One last thing to do here. All right. So uh, many of you... There we go. Many of you, as you kind of entered adulthood, you realize that you're going to have to start making some, some financial decisions and some big life planning and some big decisions to make. And we knew maybe we had some background from getting allowance as kids, or maybe we had some background from our first job and thinking about how to save money and stuff like that. But as you start to grow into adulthood, things get really complicated. just like these clickers. Okay, yeah, really complicated. This is like a For Dummies book, and this is the kind of stuff that you see when anybody says, this is how to think about money in what you do in your day-to-day -day life. Now, what I will start with is, this is what a resume might look like for somebody who is good at money. This is ja Janet Yellen. She's the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve of the United States. She thinks about money all the time. She went to Brown. She went to Yale. Like, this is a resume of somebody that you want to have looking at your money. This is not my resume. <laughs> my name is Lee Holmes. I'm the author of the PowerShell cookbook and member of the original part of the PowerShell team. And so, do not think about me as your financial planner. My goal today is to give you a, a unique way to think about things that you might not have thought about before using skills that you already have in your pocket today. Anybody here in this room absolutely has the capability to do every single thing we're going to talk about. So why is financial thinking and financial planning so complicated? The reason is called the closed form expression. So this is when you normally talk about formulas. You have a formula of calculating something or a formula for calculating something. And the whole financial industry is driven off of the idea of, I can plug some numbers into a formula, and out the other side comes like other numbers, and hopefully those other numbers are going to be useful to you. So one of the examples of this is compound interest. So this is like one of the 10 wonders of the world like the number one wonder of the financial world, where somebody will pay you money just for giving them money. And like they don't just run away with it. Sometimes they do. You don't want to talk to those people. But this is, you give them money, and then a while later they give you a bit of money back and a little bit more money back. And compounding is when you take that money that they gave you and you said, actually, keep on borrowing it. I'm fine. What you happen there is your money starts to grow and grow and grow as an exponential curve, and it's absolutely magic. So this is what the closed form formula looks like for compound interest. It's kind of complicated. You know, you put in some money, the principal. You've got how many times it compounds, how many times they pay you for the privilege of using your money. And this is what it might look like kind of idealistically. I put in one money bag put in some numbers, and out the other side come five money bags. Like, who doesn't want five money bags when you started with one money bag? So this is an example of compound interest over 32 years. So this is a closed form formula. What I can do is I can plug in actual numbers here. So I can plug in $1,000 into this formula, and out the other side comes about $5,000 or, or euro or... Uh, lira or whatever you want to talk about it. This is like not related to the, the actual form of money that you're using. So this is where people's eyes, they start to glaze over. When you start to look at formulas like this, you're like, well, they're not really like that good with math and exponents and that kind of stuff. What if I told you <laughs> there is an easier way? Jeffrey's got a big smile on his face. 
Tell me, tell me, tell me. There is an easier way. And this is the reason you're here, you have this skill. Who here has seen this help talk pic before about arithmetic operators? Oh, of course you have. You saw this the first day you used PowerShell. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. That is basically all you need to do all of the financial planning you could ever hope for in your life. And there's one very, very complicated thing that you don't see here, but I think you might know it. So this is an example of writing a compound interest calculation, but rather than with a closed form expression, you're using an imperative script. So this is the kind of script that anybody here can write in their sleep. You could do this in PowerShell, you can do this in C-sharp, you can do this in Python. So here's an example on line two, hey bank, here's a thousand dollars. In this situation, line five is saying, we're gonna get 5% interest, that's what, you know, you've God is part of a stocks or some bonds or something like that. And then lines 8 through 12, well, that's, the, that's just my money grows by 5%, multiply by 1.05. You do that five times, and what I just did is I just did a compound interest calculation for five years without doing any crazy principal NRT to the power of N over 12, like none of that stuff. This is all with a very basic PowerShell script using some simple addition and multiplication that you can look at this right now and know that it does the, exactly the right thing. You've got a, like a virtual world where you can just say every year my account balance grows by 5%. This is way simpler. And at the end, you can see a number that doesn't, it's not the same as the previous number because this was once a year for five years. So what if you wanted to do this monthly, right? That, that example that I gave before was compound interest monthly. And it's kind of the same thing. You take a look at it. So the one difference when people talk about compound interest, 5% per year, if they're saying, I'm going to do this monthly, then they don't give you like 5% a month, because then they go broke, what they'll do is give you like about a half a percent per month. So in this situation, we're going to do that exact same thing. Again, now this is a monthly calculation because I'm compounding that same interest rate monthly. So now before we had after five years, now this is after five months. So that's now taking that compound interest and making it a monthly thing. So this is where it gets really complicated. I hope you're ready for this. If I wanted to do this for 32 years, who here thinks they should copy and paste lines 8 through 12 32 times? Smart crowd. How about a for loop? Yeah, eh? some major, major financial planning going on. <clears throat> so this is an example of just a for loop where I'm still doing this monthly, and I'm going to do this 32 times. This is a counted for loop, and I'm doing that half a percent per month over 32 years. You had a question? Yeah, but that's basically a closed term to split across three lines. Yes, yes it is. Um, but yeah, his, his, his uh, comment was, well, this is kind of the same thing, but now this is over three lines. If I had done this thing, 8 through 12 here, over 32 years, I'm copying and pasting 8 to 12, like 30 times. I'd have 150 lines. Correct. His point is, you're kind of getting close to what the closed form expression did. And this, this isn't a new formula. This is a new way of thinking about closed form formulas based on things that you can kind of figure out in your own head. And this is exactly the point. Anyone played Would You Rather as a kid? Like, would you rather lose an arm or a leg? Uh, I did this with my sister one time, and I was like, I think the ratio is about, like, five arms to three legs. <laughs> Don't have much opportunity for that. So would you rather, you might say like, you know, this is the compound interest formula, the closed form. This is a script. Now, some people here are already saying, I would much prefer to have written this script. Some people might be like, mm, I'm kind of on the edge. So here's a question, contributions. Most times when you're contributing to retirement, you don't just put aside a thousand dollars and like walk away. What you do is every year you contribute a little bit of money. 
So this was the calculation that we just did to figure out how much we're going to put in just compounding with nothing else happening for 32 years monthly. Now, we can all know if I wanted to contribute an extra 10 bucks a month, we know where we would put that. Right there. We already knew. I didn't have to explain the closed form expression to you. You already knew where you would put that in the script to figure out what you would have with contributions over 32 years. So you just independently invented a very, very complicated... Oh. I'm sorry, I just get sick. Uh, <laughs> you just figured out a very complicated closed form expression without having to get into this crazy math. And like, I'm telling you, like crayon fonts don't make this any easier to understand. This is still complicated math that nobody wants to do. So th this is like clear, like code is the answer. This is, what was the question? I forget. Anyways, code is the answer. This is an approach that we can take of writing little scripts to figure out scenarios rather than having to always look somewhere else for what's like the official formula to figure this thing out. So we're going to take some examples of this. Here's life. We're part of it. We love it. Times are good. And what we're going to do is take a little tour through life on some examples where you could use some of this scripting approach to try to figure out some complicated life decisions and do some like major adulting. All right. So you graduate university, graduate college, and a very, very big thing happens in your life. You get a job. You get hired. Start working for a while. You're so happy. And you're like, what's the, like, the next happiest thing that could happen in my life? <laughs> Getting out of this place. I need to get on a vacation. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, there's common, two really common ways of figuring out vacation in the industry. One is kind of like a bank account. You get, at the beginning of the year, you get, let's say, five weeks of vacation. And then you just know, like, I just can never go to zero. In January, you plan all your vacations, make sure you never hit zero. But there's another way that's really complicated where every paycheck, you get like five hours of vacation and it accrues over time and you've got this like slowly building vacation balance. You take a vacation, it goes back down and it goes back up. That's complicated. And when you want to figure out like, I want to see my parents like in February, am I going to have enough vacation? Like that is complicated stuff. But guess what? PowerShell's the answer. So here's an example of a, a simple PowerShell script that you could use to help you figure out some of these things. Like you're not going to find a closed form expression for planning vacation balance given accruals and a future vacation schedule. So in this example, what we do is we have a vacation balance. We're going to say, let's say, 120 hours. And then we've got an accrual rate of five hours per paycheck. So this first part here is just doing a very, very simple parse where I'm taking a list of upcoming vacations. And imagine just in your head this little list that says, on this day, I take this vacation. This is how long it takes. So we have this little list of vacations we're planning to take. So here's an approach that's used very, very commonly in computer science and other kinds of things, and it's called a time-based simulation. So the way to think about a time-based simulation is like in your brain, just think about what if it was next week, what would I do if it was next week? What if it was the week after, what would I do if it was the week after? And you just are putting this virtual clock forward and acting as though it's today. So this is how we do this simulation. It's a while loop, and we know what today is. And every trip through this while loop, we advance our virtual clock by seven days. Now, when this happens, well, we just went forward by a week, when then we can accrue half of that vacation. So now you've got, as part of that simulation, your, your accrual is happening. Now, everybody, when they're getting ready for vacation, they always know what their next vacation is. So I had that, that list, right? Here's my list of vacations. I always know what the next vacation is and when it is. So when, when the current date in this simulation, when the current date gets to, like, the day that your vacation is going to start, then, like, pff, I'm on vacation, like, later, suckers. So then you, you subtract your vacation time, how long that thing was going to take. You subtract it from your virtual account balance. 
And then you, you know, I'm on this vacation, I can't take it twice, I need to like move that thing, like my next vacation is this other one. And at the end of each of these, you just output a PS custom object that tells you, given a date, what is your current vacation balance, and like just for your information, what is the vacation that you're currently on. So with just a little bit of PowerShell script, I've helped many people figure out their vacations with this. With just a little PowerShell script, you can say, yeah, this is no biggie. Like, on 521, I'm going to be down to five days of vacation from visiting the parents, but I'm never going to go below zero. Like, no one wants to come back from vacation and realize they're fired. Uh, that is not good retirement advice. By the way, while, uh, if there was any question about closed form formulas, uh, as I was practicing for this, I realized you can invent formulas. And so I spent a couple hours like literally inventing the closed form expression for uh, taking vacations given an accrual rate. Uh, it's complicated. We're not going to talk about it. It was fun to do. If you uh, want to nerd out on it, I'd be happy to nerd on it. Um, all right. That is your first couple weeks of your job. You haven't gotten fired. You got hired, took a vacation. Things are fun. So there's where we are. We move forward. You've gone on some nice vacations, and then you start hearing from HR. And they're like, have you thought about retiring? <laughs> I just got here. Back off a little. So retirement planning. Uh, I wanted to make sure that this presentation was going to be like super solid and applicable to everybody in the audience. So then you start looking up, like, what is Germany retirement plans like? And there's, like, the statutory pension insurance. Belgium has defined contribution pension plans. France has mandatory and voluntary occupational pension provisions and with tranches and stuff like that. I was like, all right. So this is crazy. This is such an amazing conference. We've got 40 international speakers, 35 different countries, so I hope you'll forgive me that there's going to be a bit of cowboy in this. Um, what we're going to use as some examples are some, some retirement concepts from the U.S. <laughs> you had a question? <laughs> yeah, turns out that you can't retire in the U.S. You just work the whole time. The question was, is it a good example? Um, so what we're going to do is use some examples from the U.S., and I'll tell you something, this is like a foreign language to people in the U.S. anyways, so you're not missing anything. So uh, many retirement accounts have this idea of tax advantage savings. There's you know, two ways that you can control your financial output. One is how much you spend, and the other one is how many taxes get taken out of your paycheck. So many countries realize that it's not in their best interest for people to retire like poor and destitute, so they do tax advantage savings plans through you know, retirement savings and those kind of things, uh, where they'll give you a tax advantage for doing this while you're earning money, so that they don't have to pay it out when you're older. But before we talk about retirement, like, that's a big question. How do you even think about retirement? Like, that's a big question to figure out, are you going to make it? Are you going to not? So before we get into retirement savings, we've got to fast forward, like, a lot. So what does it mean to, like, when you think about retiring, how do you think about retiring and how to think about your money during retirement? So we did this already. Remember, we did the, the compound interest with monthly contributions. Turns out that we can do almost the same thing when we're thinking about retiring. So this is an example of an account balance that starts somewhere, and it compounds with interest. We contribute every month an extra 10 bucks, and at the end we get to a number. So we're just going to pretend we got to this $14,000 number. You can just do this the exact opposite for retiring. Rather than adding money every month, you can subtract money every month. That's what you do, right? You're not putting money into retirement anymore. You're taking money out of that bank account. And so, like, there are complicated closed form formulas to figure this out. But really, all you gotta do, like, everybody's messed around with the PowerShell script until the numbers came out right. <laughs> so, all you gotta do is mess around with line number 10. Like, you started with a balance, and hey, when I did 100 bucks a month, 
I was in debt when I retired, and my kids are like now working in the farm. So you don't want to do that. So you just mess around with that number until you're no longer like in debt after retirement. So this is like super easy. It's exactly the same thing we just did, the same thing that we all understood, but taking that approach now to figure out how you think about retirement. Now, a bunch of this I've been mentioning, like kind of 5% interest. Um, that is another thing to think about during retirement. Um, that's just a number some people pick. Other people pick different numbers. Now, one of the ways to think about this, like this is a big variable in, in how far your money goes in retirement and during savings, because that interest, that compounding interest is like 10th world wonder. So a lot of us, we would love to have some portfolio like this. You always hear about that friend, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm like, I invested in Google when it was 480 and now it's $1,300. And like, they're so proud of bragging about what they're investing in. But everybody's after like this amazing portfolio. Um, you cannot directly invest in old people. Uh, there is... <laughs> There is one old person that people like to invest in. Uh, this is Warren Buffett, uh, one of the richest people in the world. And uh, not only rich, but also has promised to give away almost all of his money to charity, just like Bill Gates. But he's a brilliant investor. And Berkshire Hathaway is the company that he runs, and they, they pick what they're going to invest in. People realize that he is so smart at everything he does that they invest in Berkshire Hathaway. So... That's that. And there's been a ton of other companies that, like, looking back, you just love to have invested. And this is what mutual funds and, and index uh, and man, money managers are all about, is like, I'm going to chase those golden stocks for you. I'm going to do all this research, and what's going to happen, I'm going to beat the market. That's everybody's hope, is, you know, there's the market. Everyone hears about the stock market. The stock market has some returns. And everybody's goal is to get you better returns than just the market, to prove that they're smarter than just random numbers. So here's the problem. The people who do that, mutual fund managers and stuff like that, they charge you a fee for their, their brilliance. And the big issue is that on a year-to-year -year basis, very, very few mutual funds actually beat the market. But what makes it worse is mutual funds that do it for one year rarely do it the next year. So in the early 2000s, uh, uh, Vanguard started introducing these things called index funds. And it like gave up on the idea of trying to beat the market and says, we're like literally going to invest in the market. It turns out there are some computers in this. Uh, they have computers doing all these trades, just trying to make these index funds exactly match the market. And what they can do with that, since these are computers making the decisions, they no longer have to pay these really expensive fund managers to do the job, and those savings go right back to you. So this is a part where you can start to have some personal opinions and do some personal research. This isn't just anymore like plugging numbers into a formula. One of the common definitions of the market is one called the S&P 500, and that's the one, like that amazing stock portfolio that I showed back there, that's literally um, about 20 of the stocks in the S&P 500. Those are all stocks that I invested in at those times just because an algorithm did it for me. So since the year 2000, the, the return on the S&P 500 has been about 4.37%. Since 1975, it's been nearly 10. So that's like no one's going to give you the magic number of whether you think it should be five or three or eight. This is a thing where you have to like go and do some meditation, understand your idea of risk and th things like that. But that's a number that will matter, and that's a variable in this, these kind of scripts that you can just plug in and start to do some experimentation with. By the way, one of these index funds, uh, I talked about the a bit about the management fees. So the average management fee is about like 0.6 to 0.8%. Like that's pretty juicy when you're compounding that all the time. Uh, the Vanguard index fund, VOO, it's 0 0.04. So like they can get by with almost, they're still getting tons of profit at the large scale, but since customers are doing this for them, or computers are doing this for them, they don't need to take as much out of each one. So here's another thing. 
the, the, the rate you get, the interest rate is a big thing. The other thing that matters is inflation when you think about retiring and, and how to plan for it. So the 80s, the 80s were a weird place. <laughs> People wore like mats of fur on the front. They just walked around like this. They had cell phones the size of their head. Now you come into like modern times and you've got rocket boosters landing themselves from space with no human intervention. Like we are in a magical, magical world. A lot of other things have changed since the 80s. This is what a, uh, a date night might have looked like. Get yourself a burger, get yourself a beer, get some gas because you're going to drive out and enjoy the town. Um, so a date night in the 80s might have cost you about $3.09. You take this exact same thing in today's day and age, uh, $1.74 for that same burger, 4 bucks for the beer, unless you get it downstairs. Uh, it's a lot more expensive there. Uh, <laughs> gas has gone up, and I, I never actually see $2.70 gas, let alone in Europe, but supposedly it exists. But the idea here is that things just get more expensive over time. It's just what happens. So this, this virtual, this, this date night, this idea, um, governments track this inflation of prices all the time. In the U.S., they track this with the thing called the Consumer Price Index. And this is going to change depending on where you live and like specific countries and specific locales. But when this is going up, you can see that this thing does change over time. And this is a thing that you can and should plan for. So kind of the background here is uh, in the U.S., the Consumer Price Index has risen by about 4.38% since the year 2000. 1975, even longer, it's been about 4.58, so that has been pretty stable. That's a number that you know you can feel comfortable whether you think in the future prices are going to go up faster. Like This is, again, when you can start to do some research and have some personal opinions on how you're doing some retirement planning. So this is what it might look like. We're getting into some like ridiculous stuff right now. If you're trying to think about a closed form expression for retirement planning with inflation, compound interest, amortized over 32 years, compounding, like this is ridiculous math that we're doing, and we're nearly at the exact same PowerShell script. So here's an example. So what I can do as a way to think about compounding interest and inflation is just like I did with compounding interest where the, the money in my account goes up by, let's say, 5% per year, you can do the same thing with CPI and say that the rate of inflation, the way we thought about retiring in the past was with $77 a month, I can retire, and by doing that, I'll be you know near zero by the time I'm done retiring. But the thing is, that $77 is doesn't mean the same thing when you're actually retiring. So one way to think about it is, what is a number that I could pick where you know, maybe this month I'm going to spend 20 bucks, and after inflation, next month I'm going to spend $22. And you know, down the road, 10 years from now, maybe it's going to be $27. So you can take that same approach here and just kind of fudge that number and say, my monthly income, if I had taken that same $77 and said, I'm just going to keep on buying the same stuff every single time, I would now be $50,000 in debt because I was still trying to buy the same burgers and beer and gas every single month. So you can do that magical trick again is just like just messing with the numbers. In this version, we went $50,000 in debt, and all I did is just kind of mess around with line five until that number is no longer below zero. So the way to think about this, this is what lets you think about how you can expect to retire when you account for inflation. So what this one means is, in today's dollars, I can spend $43 a month. Whatever I know, like in my guts, I can buy for $43, well, I can still buy that same stuff next month. I know it's going to cost more, but I'm still going to buy the same stuff. Ten years from now, I know that I can still buy the same stuff, 
it's going to be a lot more expensive, but I can still buy the same stuff. And this is a way to think about your, your quality of life and your standard of living is, can I, do I think that I could lead the life that I wanted with this $43 a month? You know, the numbers are going to be different, obviously, but this is a good way to think about the way that you can handle retirement. Now, this is ridiculous. Like, everyone is looking at me like, this is making, like, a lot of sense. And we're going down some stuff that a, a CPA would be charging you tons. I'm not saying don't use a CPA or anything, but, like, you can start to have personal opinions on your risk and your desires, and you might have, like, little random situations that they're not going to be able to account for necessarily with these closed-form formulas. So that's a way to think about retirement how do we start thinking about now Now we can finally get back to that question that HR asked us, right? Third week on the job. So how are you going to do this retirement thing? Have you thought about your retirement savings plan? So this is another thing. Um, this is U.S. specific, but it does... I've done research on like a bunch of European kind of retirement plans, and many have something similar, so like just have to do a bit of like mental swapping in your head. Um, so in the US, there are two main retirement savings plans. They're all based on the idea of this tax advantage savings. Now, one of the ideas is, you know, you make money and then the regular, it, it's called the 401k, but the regular retirement savings plan says, if I want to contribute $100 per month to that account, well, they're going to take it out of my paycheck before it ever gets taxed. So at that point, you don't have to worry about paying taxes on that money. It's going to grow in this other account. And then the idea there is that when you finally take the money out when you retire, that's when it gets taxed. So there's another one that was um, introduced in like the early 2000s in the US. And again, sorry for the specific example, but this one is based on the idea of well, you, you take it out and it gets taxed immediately. So you get paid, taxes get taken off your paycheck, and then on that little whatever you have remaining, then you set aside $100 for retirement. Now, the interesting thing about that is that one grows over time, and when you take it out, that's completely tax-free. So these are some like really interesting ways to think about where you can personally say, do I think I'm going to be making more now? or in the future? Do I think that the tax rates, are they going to go up now, or are they going to go down? These are a lot of things that you can start to think about. So this is that, that comparison between the two. In, in a perfect, normal, everything's the same world, they basically kind of grow, and depending on how taxes are taken out, you end with the same numbers. But the place where you have some, some, some options are kind of how fast you take out the money and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about, this is where I might want to start to do some, uh, some thinking. And I say, well, let me try to write a little script to see how my, my finances would grow in retirement using the traditional 401k. This is basically all the same concepts, where I've got a virtual account balance, some virtual numbers that grow over time, a little for loop that pretends to be time as it goes on. The one thing I'll point out here is, so uh, I don't know if it's the same thing. Uh, so I know like France has like tranches of income where like income tax on the first third gets taxed at a lower rate and then the next third goes up some more. The US has this stepped income tax rates as well. So there's a the idea is when you're contributing to retirement, the, the taxes that you're saving are based on that really that highest level of income tax because it's not your effective, like your whole end of year tax rate. Because if, if you get some money taken out, then they're just not going to be, they're just not going to be taking out taxes on that very highest rate anymore. So this is the idea here. Uh, I'm doing the same thing. Now, the 401k, the traditional one, this is where we say every month I'm adding contributions to the account. And then on line 13, that's kind of like pretending like I'm retired now. This is where we say this is where the taxes actually get taken out. 
So the taxes that get taken out at the, the future effective tax rate, because that's going to be your average tax, because that's all the money you're making. So that's the way to think about, ooh, candy. <laughs> candy time. Sweet. Um, <laughs> don't take it all. There's people up here who are crying right now. Uh, okay, so that's the traditional. Then we've got the, the Roth 401k. So this is the same kind of idea, but the bit of the change here is I say, this is where every month now, they're taking the taxes out. You can see the amount that I'm contributing to my retirement plan isn't as big as it used to be because it, the taxes were already taken out. But at the end, line 14, that's all your money. There's no more taxes being taken out after retirement when you're taking out the money. So this is like amazingly complicated stuff that we can use to think about retirement, retirement planning. And like things can get very, very complicated. These were complicated examples that had simple scripts behind them. Uh, some other examples that I've used like literally in my own life. Uh, I had a house and I was trying to, we, we moved and we were trying to decide like, should we like rent out this other house or should we just like sell it and buy a new one? And these are complicated decisions. They have a lot of tax implications because when you sell a house, if the house went up in price, then you got to pay that as income. One of the crazy things in the US when you, when you rent a house as a, it now becomes a business. And in the US, the way that things are considered is, um, for your property, you've got the land, and the land costs whatever, but then you've got the house built on top of it. So they're really considered as like these two separate buckets of money. There's like the land and the improvements. And since you're now running a business out of this rental, you're allowed to say that that house, after 30 years of being used, is going to be worth nothing. Like 30 years of renting, it's going to be trash, you're going to have to rebuild it. This happens all the time in, in business when you talk about amortization schedules of hardware and, and writing things down. And so you, the same thing happens. So thinking through like amortizing the, the improvements value of your house and the tax impact on that. Uh, we had some interesting things like, you know, rental rates, you know, the, the cost of rent goes up and down over time. We were in a, uh, a place that had a homeowners association, so there were rules around when you could and could not rent. So, for example, in ours, said that only 10% of the houses could be rented out at any one time. So if, if your renter moved out, and then there was like this list of people who were wanting to rent their house out, you had to go to the back of the line and wait until you were back to the front before you could rent out your house again. So I had to do some some of this what ifing and say like what happens if like one year out of five because of this list I can't anymore rent out the house or two years out of five this is all so so personal and like custom tailored financial planning that no one is going to be able to help you when you go talking to an accountant they're not going to be able to do this kind of analysis on your behalf you can get very, very complicated and very, very custom using this style of financial planning based on your personal needs and your personal thoughts. So, you know, a lot of, you know, we're at the point now where we've gone a long, long way. We went from thinking that the only way to do financial planning was by doing closed form expressions on some very limited scenarios that other people have solved for us. We're in a very unique industry. Uh, many people in our industry, it's the first time in our family's history that we've had to struggle with, like, how do I plan for retirement? Many of our parents worked so hard to get us where we're at, and, and they're just never able to make these sort of retirement thoughts because they've been working so hard to give us the life. So we're we're in a weird first generation gap where there's people who haven't had kind of hand me down knowledge about, you know, maybe they get a lot of hand me down knowledge about how to like tend the farm, but how to tend your money and how to think about finances that doesn't come around very often. And it's a very, very common problem. 
There was a, there was a really interesting thread on Twitter, uh, Ian Coldwater, and it was like, you know, I, my parents were dirt poor, now I'm making money, like, literally, how do I think about money? But from the ground up. It's a complicated world, it is. Um, but now that you've got the concepts to be able to think about this in a structured and a rational way, this is a bunch of the resources that came out of that thread. It was crazy, like 618 comments. It was just a gold mine. So people have recommended some sites. Some of these are US-centric. Some of them are not. Um, there are other Reddits and things that are local to individual countries. But the thing to realize is that now you can go and look up financial advice for your situation and then port that to a PowerShell script and start to do some actual analysis given your specific situations. So it's a long journey. It's a really fun one. But uh, I hope this is a thing that really gives you what you need to retire a couple of years early. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Uh, yes, in the back. The question was, at which age am I going to retire? So uh, if I'm going to pass out a hat. If you could all put $10 in it, uh, we'll see. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah, the, the question slash comment is, when you don't have these closed form formulas, couldn't you do iterative approaches in something like Excel? And absolutely, people have done amazing things using Excel and VBA and macros and like simulations and all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, I think the assumption is that that's hugely popular in the financial planning industry. Uh, a lot of us have already have the skill of doing this in, in PowerShell or C Sharp or Python, and this is something that we can take using the skills that we already have, but it's a great point. Question. Yeah, the, the question comment was, uh, if everybody goes down the index fund path, what happens to the mutual fund industry? And I think, no? No, no, if everyone's investing in all the same funds, yeah. because, you know, there's a chicken and egg there. Yeah, if everybody's investing in the same funds, I think that's where this is kind of what a market economy does. If people find that there are major, major issues in like, hey, all these sheep are doing us something, I'm going to go counterculture and do some other things, then they're going to have a mutual fund that's like amazingly successful and like props to them and I'll be jumping on that. Uh, we'll see if it happens. Uh, question I heard. No. Any other questions? Oh, in the back. There are women who do it too, by the way. <laughs> the great comment was, hey, like, there are people who uh, like to th try to do this, try to beat the market, and one common approach is to say, I'm going to set aside, this is my retirement money, and this is my bonus money, right? This is the money that I'm going to use to try to play the market. If it goes completely away, I'm going to sleep fine at night because I know I'm still retiring. This is the same way that people think about gambling, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's absolutely, it's a good point. 
There's a question over here somewhere. Uh, yeah. Did you actually rent the house or sold the house? <laughs> the, question for, uh, the question is, did I rent the house or did I sell it? Uh, so I'm going to pass forward a hat. And for like $100, I will give you the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. Enjoy retirement. Thank you.